Hello, I'm Jennifer Lauber Patterson, a Managing Director of Frontier Impact Group and also the Interim CEO of Renewalium. I'm so excited to be at this conference. Um, I've been in climate solutions for 25 years, so this has taken a long time to get to this stage. Um, but it does give you a lot of hope when you see all these people um, at this conference all looking to invest in the sector. And it's so crucial because we need to move more quickly. Um, I was in banking, I think, um, 15 years ago, and at that time trying to get solar, PV, um, interest in that and financed. And it's taken so long to get these technologies deployed. Um, and we've got to become much faster because we can't afford to be as low as what we have been in the past. One of the reasons I'm really um, passionate about Renewalium is that it is aiming to solve a real gap in the market. I don't believe we have a clear energy transition plan to replace carbon intensive diesel. There's no silver bullet in this area, unfortunately. I think electrification is amazing and an area we need to be investing in more and is a big part of the solution. But I think there's a number of solutions such as green hydrogen as well. But liquid fuels is really important to the solution as well. Renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel are critical. Without renewable diesel, it's like being in a triathlon and not having a bike. You won't win the race, but I don't think we're going to finish the race, and we can't afford that. So our mission is to be the leader in the production of renewable diesel and say sustainable aviation fuel in Australia. We've been developing this business for six years. It has been pretty hard because when the renewable diesel price and the diesel prices were at 60 cents a litre, um, you, you know, this project was not going to be getting up. But the technology has actually been around a long time. It's just that the commercial drivers weren't there. So this is a huge opportunity to really be able to scale this up quickly um, and really have a significant um, impact. What is really um, important in understanding the opportunity is there are a lot of hard to abate sectors where electrification and hydrogen just aren't providing the solution. So they're important, but areas such as construction, there was a report done by Lendlease with um, a university in Queensland, and they identified that 40% would need to come from renewable diesel in order for them to become net carbon zero. Now that's extraordinary. Also, there's no capital expenditure that's needed to convert to renewable diesel. So, so, so it's a quicker way of actually being able to um, move to net carbon zero. Um, quite often what I find is there's confusion between biodiesel and renewable diesel in Australia. Renewable diesel is moving a lot more quickly than what it is in Australia. Biodiesel is a, is a different type of technology that uses oil-based streams, and in Australia, it, can, it has to be blended. And you can only use about 20% of that biodiesel as part of the blend as a maximum. With the renewable diesel, it is 100% drop-in, and that is a significant difference. It's got the same chemical composition as um, normal diesel, so you don't have those same insurance issues and other issues that you have with biodiesel. So it really is a game changer in the market. But what we're finding is demand is outstripping supply. And this is why we've got such volatile prices in the, in the market. Um, Lend-Lease had to pay $4.50 a litre to import renewable diesel into Australia. I think it's a bit crazy because what we do is we export our biomass um, and our imports, and we actually then import the fuel. It just doesn't make sense to be doing that, so I think we need to be smarter in the way that we do things. But what we do know is the prices, global prices are going to be high. For us to have a competitive advantage and for economic development, we need to be doing more of these projects in Australia. The demand is there. The International Energy Agency is saying 50 
billion litres of renewable diesel will be demanded by 2030. And companies like Qantas, they have a target of 10% um, of their fuel incorporating sustainable aviation fuel. Now, when you have around 9 billion litres a year that you use, that's a substantial demand. So, a little bit about the technology. Um, this show, it's just a process map. It shows the inputs that actually come into the process. One thing that we're very conscious of is the social licence to operate. This is something we put a lot of time into and what we're hoping is, because we're one of the pioneers in this industry, we can really have a really high baseline in terms of that social licence and what can be used and, and, and should be used. So we shouldn't be replacing food crops, you know, that's, that's a no. Um, so those aspects are something that we have considered, um, you know, very, very deeply. Also, um, then, with the inputs, we use a high temperature prolysis system. It's the high temperature, the 1,100 degrees, that gets it, gets it to that drop in diesel standard. Um, we don't have that level of temperature in Australia here at the moment, um, but that's pretty exciting. And the way that the, t the IP has been developed, the yield is exceptional. So for one tonne of dry biomass, we can produce 330 litres of renewable diesel. So that yield is incredible and nothing else that we've seen in a prolysis system before. As you can see, there are some tail gases that, can't, that are, are an output, but we use those um, as an input into our electricity production process. So we try and use any, any, anything that we can as part of this overall circular um, um, model. So we can produce the renewable diesel, um, sustainable aviation fuel, which has been um, new to the company because that is only currently being certified, but very exciting. And the technology can also produce green hydrogen, and that's something we also plan to do down the track. Biochar, that's another big component of this technology, another byproduct. And we heard a bit about activated carbon, and this has a lot of, lot of very similar benefits, but really important for land regeneration. And also wood vinegar. Eight, we'll be producing six million litres for just this first project, and that helps in the nutrient uptake in plants. Here we are in places like wheat belts and areas where they need new organic fertilisers or enhancers, and we're developing projects that can actually achieve those outcomes. What's really important to our model is not only are we producing clean renewable fuels, we're also helping in land regeneration and working with communities in delivering a circular economy model. So this is a, a picture of our first plant. We actually have a JV with Carnarvon Energy in Western Australia. We thought we would um, um, partner with an oil and gas company um, in our first project um, because they had a lot of that um, knowledge of the oil and gas industry, which we thought could add value in what we were doing. So we've got a whole pipeline of projects um, that we're developing with um, Carnarvon, but this is our first one. It's in Narragin, which is about two hours south of Perth. It's right in the middle of the wheat belt. And what we love is with the technology, it's actually modular and, we can, and it's smaller scale than for some of you that know Fisher Trope. That's where you need to have a really large scale plant. But a lot of the times it's not economic because if you have to transport your feedstock too far, the economics just don't pan out. But what we love with this model is we've got these uh, modular units that can be scaled up. They're in the community. The biomass that's sourced in the community is processed in that community and some of the outputs can be to the benefit of the community. It creates the jobs, it creates the economic growth. And um, so it's pretty exciting. Now, our pipeline at the moment is um, $10 billion worth across Australia. We've got a couple of projects um, overseas that we've also got targeted, so that's pretty exciting. One million litres, that initial pipeline, but that will continue to grow. 4.5 million tonnes of CO2 will be offset as a consequence um, of this initial portfolio that we, we're aiming to, to develop. There's around 360,000 tonnes of biochar 
And for, for those that, you, that are in, in that market, that's multiple times what we actually have in, in the Australian market at the moment. So the value add that this produces, not only in helping companies that need help to actually transition to, towards net carbon zero and achieve that goal, the value add to communities is just so critical and so important. So this explains the circular economy model a little bit more. So if you have a look at um, our little wheel, um, we start with sourcing biomass um, from the community, producing it into a, a fuel. There's byproducts with the biochar and the wood vinegar. Um, they can be used as fertilisers. We're working with other companies to turn them into fertilisers for the local community and other parts of Australia. And for those that um, I'm sure most people are aware of the rising cost of chemical fertilisers, so what is great, it is driving farmers now to change to more organic means. And a big cost is often the freight. 50% of the cost of fertilisers can be the freight. So you can see the advantages of actually being able to provide a local solution. We then help with the land re regeneration. Um, in this particular model in Narragin, we're also working with farmers around oil mallee um, plantations, but shelter belt. The reason that's important is our focus is around land regeneration. So with the oil mallee, it helps with salinity management and, um, and, and land regeneration, but we can compass it every time it grows and use it as a fuel. So that's how we plan to grow the capacity in that part of the, part of the region, and it's pretty exciting. So yeah, a billion, a billion litres, um, circular economy, 5,000 jobs with the portfolio that we've got identified so far. The wood vinegar and biochar, regenerating landscapes, which is, which is a passion for me. Um, and there's downstream opportunities with graphene. I won't go into graphene today, but the biochar is a very rich graphene composition. Um, and that's partly because of the high temperature and the, and the process. The inventor behind this, has got, this, will, this will be his fifth successful invention. His, his knowledge is around hot temperatures and materials. So um, the brake pads on some of the major airline um, planes at the moment, he was involved in the development of that. So this guy is a genius and what he's done is, is amazing and I think will be game changing. So what is the opportunity? Um, as we've highlighted, um, we have developed, I think, quite a unique circular economy model. And I think this is important. You know, one thing um, I would get um, sometimes from investors is if you're doing fuel, just focus on fuel because we just want you to focus on fuel production. And I used to find that challenging because what I could see and what hopefully you can see, that that's where we've sometimes gone wrong. Because if you just focus on fuel, who's focusing on the land regeneration? Who's focusing on connecting with the community? Who's focusing on making sure that those byproducts are being optimised in the best possible way? We need to rethink the way we look at things because the benefits of this and these circular um, economy models are absolutely enormous. Yep, we do need 7.5 million. That's the number that we, we are looking for at the moment. We have um, a, an ability to gain access to exclusivity on the SAF um, technology um, that's been offered to us and that's something we'd like to move on. We believe that our project is the most competitive in terms of SAF pricing that currently a project that could be delivered in Australia could deliver. And we believe we're the first project that could deliver SAF. Because we've already got Narigen project underway We've actually um, are waiting just for the EPA um, approvals and development approvals to come through. This could be potentially the first SAF project um, in the um, Australian market, so that would be pretty, pretty exciting. But what we um, also need is some funds to help get that pipeline going as quickly as possible and to continue to grow that pipeline. Um, that's really um, quite important. And it is a conservative, um, there is a really good return attached to this, um, around 40%, it's a very conservative number. 
but it's the return also in what we're doing for communities and the impact that we're having to have. Because as mentioned at the start, we're not going to get to net carbon zero unless this is being considered. And this is a gap in the Australian market at the moment. And what I love about it, I mentioned to you earlier about being involved in climate solutions for 25 years. What I love is it's a one plus one equals 10 this. Because when you look, it's not just the fuel and what that can do, it's all the other byproducts, the impact they have, like biochar. That's um, sequestering carbon in the soil. When you're producing graphene, that's putting carbon back into materials. This is making sure we're using the biomass for the best possible value add opportunity and making sure that regional um, communities benefit most. This is why I'm so excited by this. Um, and I hope you're as excited as me, but it is an important part of the solution and we'd love to talk more with you about it. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Jennifer. Um, opening the floor for questions. I know you're all hungry. <laughs> Thanks. Kurt Winter from the Carbon Market Institute. Um, you talked a bit about the demand or commitment made by private companies to move towards sustainable aviation fuels. I'm wondering about um, your view on the need for a market-based policy framework to get there um, and or um, national regulation to actually drive the demand and the development of the market. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Because um, one of the disadvantages we've had, we haven't had much incentives um, in Australia around aviation and renewable diesel. That is, I believe, changing. There's been a lot of advocacy undertaken. We're part of working groups with Bioenergy Australia. So watch this space, because that's another value add, because we're not taking into account in our numbers any value add from po positive policy. Um, but we're very confident that there will be positive policy. Other changes that have been developed, because um, INJA, being able to report national reporting um, energy, um, INJA, um, keep forgetting what the acronym actually stands for, all these acronyms. Um, there's, there's a new um, standard that's coming out early next year that will define renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel, that, that's really important. And the other thing as well, there's going to be a renewable diesel quality fuel standard and that's going to happen all of next year. So you can see all the challenges um, that we had a couple of years ago, but now everything's coming together and, um, and these, these just make it a lot easier because corporates need to obviously be able to measure their, their um, carbon impact as well. So it's a pretty exciting time. G'day, someone from Horizon. Um, one of the key concerns around renewable fuels has been that it starts to encroach into the human food chain. What are you doing to address that concern? Um, can you ask that question again? Sorry. So, so one of the key concerns yep. around renewable fuels has been that it starts to encroach into the human food chain. Yeah. So some of the raw material you're using. So, yep. so what are you doing to address that concern? Yeah, absolutely. There's actually two types of renewable fuel. There's one that's called HVO. And that tends to use things like, you know, your cooking oils. And believe it or not, we send a lot of that to Singapore. And Neste actually then produces that into a um, fuel, which then goes to Europe at the moment, and they use most of it there. Um, the, the thing with HVO is there's only so much cooking oil that's available. So in that situation, they, they might, you know, need to start looking at other alternatives. And people are concerned that canola, for example, is going to be grown for fuels instead of fuel production. So that is a really key issue. But that's a, an advantage of our technology because in our um, technology we're using um, woody cellulosis type materials. There's a lot of waste materials that, that are available. We can do rotational crops and so we're not replacing um, um, food crops. We're actually enhancing the development of food production. Um, we can even use construction and demolition waste. This technology can actually even use um, MSW. Um, we just haven't gone down that track yet because going, we're, going, we're finalising our first EPA approval, which has gone well, 
But as you could imagine, MSW would have taken another year on the EPA approval framework. Um, but yeah, so that, that's pretty all pretty exciting. So this is one of the advantages of it. You can scale it up without actually needing to encroach on food production. But good question. I think everyone's hungry. <laughs> so, um, folks, uh, next is lunch, and then we're back in the Olympic room for a plenary at 1.45. So 1.45 in the plenary room. Thank you. <laughs>